two, three, four. Okay. Um, well, welcome to the struggle for full employment. My name is Sheila Collins. I'm going to chair the session. And um, I'm not gonna stay we have three speakers. All of us actually are members of the National Jobs for All Coalition. We just did a panel previous to this, which was very well attended on the um, lessons of the Great Depression and the New Deal for today. So this is kind of a slightly different take uh, on um, dealing with part of the lessons of the Great Depression and the New Deal, but also the later struggle for full employment that uh, succeeded the, the New Deal era. Um, so this presentation will explore New Deal job creation efforts and FDR's Economic Bill of Rights that began with the right to a decent job. It discusses two major attempts to secure full employment in the immediate post-World -War, War II period and in the 1970s, the first ending in the defeat of full employment legislation and the second in the failure to implement a watered-down Full Employment Act. Full employment, the, present will, the presentations will show, um, will take a fundamental break with neoliberalism and a reorientate, if we had full employment, it would be a fundamental break with neoliberalism and a reorientation of power from big business and Wall Street to middle and working class people, and would require the full-scale social movement that both earlier struggles lacked. So our panelists are in order of appearance. Um, Trudy, you Helen, I think, should Helen. because okay. she's in the historical. Yeah. Helen Ginsberg, who will start, uh, is Professor Emerita of Economics at Brooklyn College uh, and co-founder of the National Jobs for All Coalition. And Helen is author of numerous books and articles on employment policy, full employment uh, policies and strategies, um, and an excellent historian of the full employment movement. Uh, next is Chuck, or Tree? Chuck, Chuck, I think, to Chuck talk Bell, about the legislation. Chuck Bell, vice chair of the National Jobs for All Coalition, and um, co-author of Shared Prosperity, The Drive for Decent Work, and Chuck is, uh, has 20 years of experience working in consumer and healthcare advocacy and community movements for jobs and economic justice and is employed by the Consumers Union. Thank you. Uh, Trudy Goldberg, our last speaker, uh, is a professor of social policy emerita from Adelphi University. School of Social Work, where she also directed the uh, PhD program. Trudy chairs the National Jobs for All Coalition, is also one of the co-founders, um, and also a co-chair of the Columbia Seminar on Full Employment, Social Welfare, and Equity. Uh, Trudy is author of several books on social policy, uh, and of course numerous book chapters and articles on social policy and employment policy. Um, I might also say that, that uh, we're, we're uh, three of us here are co-chairs of this Columbia Seminar in Full Employment and Social Welfare and Equity. And if any of you are interested in being on the mailing list to come to the Columbia Seminars, please give us your name uh, afterwards. Also, I think, Chuck, do you want to mention the thing that just happened? Just, just happened? Right. So um, we participated in a panel upstairs about the lessons of the New Deal and the relevance for the period that we're living in now, including for movements like Occupy Wall Streets. And uh, the group, uh, after hearing the presentations, decided that it would be a great idea to rally behind the demand that the Occupy Wall Street group had made. Uh, to create a national jobs program, to create 25 million jobs that are open to everyone, uh, including uh, ex-offenders and uh, immigrants, uh, and to um, have those jobs be involved in um, revitalizing the infrastructure of the country, uh, cleaning up the environment, promoting clean energy, um, and providing services that people need. So they decided that they would support that demand by gathering as a contingent at Union Square on May Day. 
simply because their actions proposed for May Day. We don't know exactly what time yet, but uh, and that we would also invite other um, Occupy groups around the country that are having May First actions to also rally behind a jobs demand. Um, so we'll have more information th about that on our website at National Jobs for All Coalition and JFAC. .org. And jobscampaign.org. And jobscampaign.org. And um, we'll have probably have a follow-up meeting, too. So if people want to get on our mailing list, I'll just distribute that, um, and you can sign up to be on our mailing list. I read an article on the web recently called The Ghost of Full Employment. And the author was a um, young scholar in Cornell who had just discovered some of the history of full employment and uh, was very excited about it. And so what I'm hoping to do is to, I hope it's not a ghost. Um, are we ghosts or does full employment have relevance today? Uh, we need to know something about what it means, what its origin is, and how it applies to this crisis and to the continuing crisis which existed before this crisis and will doubtless continue without it. And that is the crisis of unemployment. Um, and this is the most severe unemployment since the Depression. Uh, we have 20, officially 8.3% unemployment. Uh, we calculate that it's at least double that when you count the hidden unemployed and uh, people who are not counted but want jobs or want full-time jobs. Okay, uh, I think we have to go back to the Great Depression, uh, which was the great economic crisis of that time, and we still have um, the impact of it. Um, during that time, unemployment rose from 3% in 1929 to 25% in 1933 when Roosevelt got into office. Um, traditional economics said that the cure is lower wages and they uh, don't believe that there is anything uh, such as unemployment. And I can tell you as an economist that that is still the belief of mainstream neoclassical economics, and you can check Joseph Stiglitz, you know, relay this also. Uh, the economy is self-regulating, and uh, it comes to full employment, and anyone who's still out of work, it's just voluntary. Well, and so the onus of unemployment was put on the individual, not on the society. But the New Deal came in, and they couldn't <laughs> just do nothing. Herbert Hoover got booted, and he did some things. Uh, and there was social movements. I mean, this was a country that was bleeding and people were out in the streets and they were pushing and there had to be a response. And the response was not to cut expenditures. Remember Hoover and that philosophy is austerity, belt tightening, and Roosevelt went in and he was reluctant. He was not, you know, of that persuasion. Um, but he, he had to act that way. And so there were efforts to provide jobs 
directly by government. And this was breaking with past economic thinking, okay? Um, there were a lot of programs, not just one or two. Uh, two that I'll just mention briefly, uh, the CCC, which was a program for unemployed youth, mostly men and young men, and it did conservation work. Two billion trees planted. Three. What? Three well, million. I took the low <laughs> estimate. <laughs> they thinned four million acres of trees, uh, some on burned over landscapes. Uh, they stocked streams with nearly a billion fish. And they left a legacy of land and water and forest preservation for future Americans, including ourselves. Um, the best known program and the most controversial was the WPA, uh, which was a direct employment program. People were hired by the government. Uh, and at its peak, 3.3 million workers, uh, Roosevelt originally, they thought of giving a job to every one of the unemployed, but it was turned out to be about a third. Uh, now, I'm going to mention some of the things that they did, because the chief, one of the things that every government job creation program faces is the charge of boondoggling or um, make work. That was, you know, this is make work. Well, they made work. And we have their legacy, and I'm going to, they built or reconstructed 617 miles of roads, 124,000 bridges and viaducts, 120,000 public buildings, thousands of parks, playgrounds, athletic fields. They drain malarial swamps. They organized nursery schools, taught illiterate adults, and illiteracy was widespread, to read and write. Uh, they set up theaters. Uh, artists uh, produced murals. Uh, writers, and um, they helped also to save the dignity of a lot of people. And nevertheless, the charge of leaf raking. Well, I guess you have to break leaves. And the family was no leaf yeah. raking. <laughs> uh, these were not perfect <laughs> programs. I'm not arguing that these were perfect programs, but they did a hell of a lot. Um, but actually, for a variety of reasons, number one is that there were always obstacles uh, to getting through these programs. Uh, the expenditures of the New Deal were never large enough to end the Depression, which only ended with World War I, Two. where the expenditures Two. were huge. And, you know, nobody could stop spending on war, and then um, the labor force expanded, and people who were considered to be uh, unemployable suddenly became employable. And people who, uh, women made breakthroughs, African Americans made breakthroughs. I'm not saying that all prejudice disappeared, that's a fallacy, but there were breakthroughs, uh, particularly because the labor market was tight. Um, in 1944, in the midst of the war, January 1944, Roosevelt proposed a second Bill of Rights, and these were economic rights. First on the list was the right for all to useful and remunerative jobs. And he had a humanistic vision of employment as an economic right. It's a very um, mind-shattering view. 
It was a very humanistic view of employment and the right to earn enough to provide adequate food, clothing, and recreation, the right to adequate housing, medical care, economic security, um, much of which we still don't have, education. And I want to make the distinction that when we use the term full employment, there are two strands of thinking. And this original, older strand of thinking that Roosevelt had in mind is in the human rights tradition. It's expansive. And, you know, after the war, this was written into this philosophy into the UN Charter, into the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, the British economist uh, William Beveridge um, defined full employment in terms of human beings who are out of work, and it always meant having more vacant jobs than job seekers. And according to Beveridge, and I think he's right, the message that society sends to a worker who is unable to find a job is that you are useless. And even if you have unemployment benefits, it does not erase that. We look at employment as something part of a social um, a society. But later on, we see that unemployment came to be defined strictly as an unemployment rate and even a price level. Okay, um, it's very weird from today's perspective to think that in 1944, even the Republican presidential nominee Thomas Dewey embraced support for full employment and emphasized the government's obligation to ever intervene in the economy to provide sufficient jobs when necessary, to give every man and woman a chance to earn a decent living. And a decent living is part of the concept. When we talk about full employment, we're not talking about people making sub-minimum wages that, you know, uh, can't support a person in dignity. So it's one strand. Um, and also, the early thinkers, uh, and they deserve a lot of credit, they recognized that full employment also enriched society because people are working and building things and, um, you know, taking care of children or uh, doing uh, work that would not be done but is adding to the living standards. Exactly the opposite of what you hear uh, today. Now, the expression, the full employment, there was an attempt in 1945 to have full employment enacted in law, uh, that initial bill passed in the Senate but was defeated, and what we got was the 1946, the Employment Act of 1946, which explicitly rejected full employment, but it was a defeat, but a lot of people still call it the Full Employment Act of 1946. It was an important law. Uh, it set up the Council of Economic Advisors and um, a couple of things, but it wasn't a full employment. Uh, talked about maximum employment, uh, and that was uh, deliberate not to talk about full employment and not to talk about rights, okay? Now, in the post-war era, there was not a return to mass unemployment, which was a fear people had. 
But the lows of wartime um, unemployment never returned either. And there was, I should say, the march on Washington, black unemployment, for instance, uh, was always double white unemployment during this period, as it still is. And the march on Washington in 1963 uh, was the march for jobs and freedom. And the theme of job creation runs through Martin Luther King's writings. Uh, he reiterated over and over again that government should become an employer of last resort. We need an economic bill of rights. This would guarantee a job to all people who want to work. Well, if you think full employment is the idea of a kook, then we have a list of kooks, Franklin Roosevelt, four-term president, Martin Luther King, you know, I'll join that um, <laughs> kook. Now, during this period, full employment came to be more and more defined simply as uh, an unemployment rate, and that kept on rising. But 4% was considered um, pretty good. Uh, full employment, and uh, again, during the Vietnam War years, unemployment fell below 4%, slightly below 4%, and people, a lot of people thought, wow, we have full employment. And in the same years, we had riots in every, virtually every city in the United States, the urban riots uh, in ghettos all over. And when Lyndon Johnson set up a high-level commission to investigate the cause, they found that one of the leading causes was this huge unemployment and unemployment, uh, which was corroborated by a special survey done by the Department of Labor, which showed that the unemployment rate the national unemployment rate had very little to do with what was happening in these areas. And the commission, the Kerner Commission, set up to uh, look into this, recommended the creation of several million jobs in three years for these areas. And of course, that was never done. Okay, the same time, 1968, Milton Friedman, the guru of economics, uh, of neoclassical economics, president of the American Economic Association, uh, talked about the natural rate of unemployment. He proclaimed that there is a natural rate of unemployment, and if unemployment goes below that rate, you have accelerating inflation, and therefore you can't even uh, try for uh, it, and uh, maybe you should even increase unemployment. And believe me, if you look at economic policy, increasing unemployment became uh, a policy of government very often. Uh, we had a small 3 more minutes. Well, I can't. <laughs> the only thing I can say is that the Humphrey Hawkins Full Employment and Balanced Growth Act of 1948 of 1978 uh, was in response not, you know, to this fact and to the fact that Hawkins, who was a black legislator from the Watts area, saw unemployment as, or the right to a job as a human right and uh, pushed very hard for it. 
However, and he had in his initial bill the right to a job, enforceable right to a job. The person couldn't get a job uh, and the government couldn't provide a job. They had the right to sue. Uh, the Humphrey Hawkins Act did not, it passed after many years, but it was very, very much changed. And the first thing to go was the right to sue, which meant there is no enforceable mechanism. Uh, there's a lot of, um, you know, uh, misinformation about that act. It did not state that 4% unemployment is full employment. It stated that as an interim goal. Um, but of course, there was no counter pressure. There was no counter pressure pushing, you know, no big counter pressure pushing for stronger bill. And since 1978, we have had a full employment bill act, which is the law of the country, which has been virtually ignored and violated. I mean, it's on the books. I meant to bring a copy <laughs> to show you. Um, so what, okay, I cannot <laughs> do what you did, which was to take you, more time. You took 25 minutes, what? Kellen. You did take 25 minutes. I gave you 25 minutes. Oh, okay. <laughs> Can she say a, a word? Of, she can yeah, a okay. A code. Yeah, I, I my code is um, <laughs> that I think I we five minutes. <laughs> we have to publicize what has been done in every community. Uh, I think we have to reach out to the grassroots level. I think we have to also, and it's very important to define full employment in terms, not of stopping at 4%, I mean, what happens to the other people? That means you're, you've uh, stripped them of their humanity. And so I think we have to get back to this other notion, you know, that it's not just when I get a job that it's full employment, it's that we're all in this together. Now, that's not an easy task. It's not an easy task, um, but I think maybe it's something we could um, discuss. And I think the other thing is that you can't have, you need an ethos. And in the past 30 years, that has been crushed so that people feel disconnected from each other. And I think that the neoliberal austerity and uh, cuts and budget, that can't work. It absolutely can't work. And all I can do is to say that uh, unemployment uh, can be overcome, but it can't be overcome without a struggle. And that takes people with both an ideological commitment and uh, a desire to build a vision that is of a better society. Thank you. Thank you. Chuck? First, I just want to mention that Helen Ginsburg uh, was perhaps too modest because she was actually quite involved directly in the struggle to pass the Humphrey Hopkins bill in the 1970s in the national movement of community, labor, uh, religious groups, um, uh, civil rights groups, fighting for the enactment of a right to a job. Uh, for pe and the fact that it is on the books, you, you know, yes, it was never fully implemented as it should have been, yeah. but it definitely uh, pushed the bar forward on where we want to be. And I start from a similar place. I mean, I believe that, you know, we have two or three programs in the United States that are essentially universal programs, uh, Medicare, Social Security, and universal compulsory education. 
Uh, and on those three areas, we take the position, everybody's in the program, nobody is yeah. out of the program. You, you have a right, you have an enforceable right uh, to be included in those programs. And I believe that we need a similar national commitment uh, for employments that, um, uh, you know, Mike, Martin Luther King had said, it's the psycho uh, psychological equivalent of murder to deny a person a job. It's a because the, it's the way, yeah. it's the ticket to economic stability and security in this country. And you cannot support yourself in some reliable way uh, without jobs or income. So um, we have a stake in the welfare of our, our neighbors and other people in our community as to whether they can get a living wage job or not. And so when things are going wrong and we have workers that are confined in various sectors of the economy, such as farm workers that are not subject to wage and hours laws, that's the problem of all of us. Uh, when women are denied opportunities to advance in the workforce and have a different tiered employment structure, makes them very hard to re-enter the workforce after having children, that's the problem of all of us. It's not just the problem of women or the problem of farm workers. And further that, you know, we, um, full employment has a very uh, specific meaning in that even at times where uh, the economy has been at relatively low unemployment. There have still been millions of American workers who were denied economic opportunity. So if we look back into uh, the period around 2000 when President Clinton was leaving office, we had paid off the, the financial deficit. Unemployment was around, hovering around 4%. There were still 6 million workers in the country that could not find a job. Uh, and many more workers working part-time that wanted full-time work. And in fact, the slogan at the time, if you remember, is, you know, America's creating millions of jobs and I have three of them. And uh, so we have uh, much uh, underemployment in the economy. Many people who are thrown out of their jobs by corporations when they're in their 40s and their 50s never really find, again, uh, full-time work. They're working at part-time jobs as cashiers uh, in retail stores or in restaurants. It's not the equivalent of having a decent job. So th that's our starting place. And... Um, I was going to talk about some of the legislation we have pending today uh, that would do more to create uh, jobs for Americans. Um, and um, first of all, I, I brought a couple charts with me to kind of explain where we're at. Um, we have what we call the jobless recovery. Um, so, jobless. Jobless recovery. So, we have, um, in the Great Recession that started at the end of 2007, we were at an unemployment rate of around 4.5% at that point. Uh, we directly lost 8 million jobs as a result of the financial meltdown and cuts in, um, cuts in corporate and, and government hiring. Um, so we have been gaining jobs back um, since about the beginning of 2010. But you can see these are the bars show the amount of jobs we lost. These are the amount of jobs we've gained back uh, going through the middle of 2011. The rate of job growth has been very slow, as we know. And so that's why we have what's called the jobs hole. Uh, that this is the difference to get back to about 4.5% unemployment, or what it was at the end of the um, 2007, is about 10 million jobs right now. So we're short 10 million jobs. And at this rate, it's going to take uh, five or six years at a minimum to get back to where we need to be at where we were just in 2007 when many of us thought it was an inadequate time. Um, so we're often told we can't have uh, a jobs program because of the financial deficit, that the government is somehow out of money and we can't afford to have a jobs program. And so this chart is known as the chart that you must show at any meeting where the financial deficit is discussed because what this chart shows is that the costs of the U.S. wars in Iraq and Afghanistan plus the Bush tax cuts uh, are responsible for a huge share of the deficit. Those are the light orange and the dark orange shown in the chart. And that the costs of responding to the economic collapse, uh, the TARP and economic recovery, are actually relatively small and sunset over time. So if you want to look at the things that are driving the financial deficits that we have, uh, it includes the cost of the wars and the tax cuts and the out-of-control health care costs uh, that we have for Medicare and Medicaid and other public programs because we fail to effectively control the growth of health care costs here in America, which is another big social policy issue that we can discuss at another time. So um, in addition, though, to the financial deficit, what we say in the Jobs for All movement is we have a deficit of good jobs. We don't have all the jobs we need uh, for Americans who want to work. 
And we also have a deficit of underinvestment in infrastructure and public services. Uh, we have, for example, the physical infrastructure of the country, the roads and the bridges and the schools. The American Society of Civil Engineers gives our infrastructure a D letter grade. Uh, it's not far below the quality it should be. And similarly, if we look at uh, public services, uh, we have many Americans not getting access to higher education. We have one out of three Americans who needs um, affordable housing. We have uh, chronic shortages of long-term care workers to help people who are elderly and disabled. Uh, we have 14 million kids who take care of themselves after school because there aren't enough after school programs. We have uh, parks and uh, recreational facilities that are run down all over the country, youth programs that are shutting down. There's clearly many, many things. If we met the human needs that we have in this country, everybody uh, could be working. So, um, if we, uh, also, we need to appreciate that unemployment is very expensive to us as a country. And this chart shows that since the beginning of recession, we've actually lost $2.8 trillion in national output in the GDP in goods and services that we would otherwise have had if we had stayed at the same employment level. And this means far less money in consumers' pockets to spend money and revive the economy. And so, for example, if you think of child care work, for every dollar that you put in, you invest in child care, you get $2 back into the economy because the, the workers can spend money as consumers and put the money back into the economy. And also parents can work at their jobs for longer and go to uh, community college uh, and advance in their careers. Um, so those are the benefits of, of putting people back to work. Uh, and just one other thing I want to show you is that if you, we do face choices as a society as to where we put our money. So that for every billion dollars that you have, it creates different employment outcomes. If you have a billion dollars and you put it into oil, coal, and natural gas, which is over here, you get about 5,300 jobs. Whereas if you put it into education, you would have 27,000 jobs. Uh, healthcare, clean energy, far more efficient job generators uh, than uh, the military or oil, coal, and natural gas. So um, why have legislation um, it seems obvious, and, but in the last meeting someone said, why, you know, some of the legislation we have to create jobs is so inadequate, why even bother? Well, I think it's important to put some words on paper that would explain how we might create jobs in the country through a program of public investment. We're not getting the public investments that we need, and yet if we invest in things like rehabilitating our schools or clean energy, it will have very many positive effects for the economy, not just in terms of the jobs that are created, but also in the multiplier effects of having those uh, services that we very badly need. Uh, so for example, if we invest in clean energy, we'll be able to actually get a handle on this problem of high gas prices that everyone is talking about. We'll have other ways for people to get around uh, with hybrid cars or mass transit will actually be a Affordable. Uh, similarly, we had, uh, in President Obama oppose, uh, proposed the American Jobs Act, uh, which would have rehabilitated 30,000 schools around the country. We have schools that are uh, actually 100,000 schools with deferred maintenance needs. He, he had proposed going after just a third of them and, in, and upgrading them, making sure that they were safe buildings and didn't have toxic you know, heating and ventilating systems, and actually might have some affordances like solar power. Uh, or uh, energy efficiency and energy conservation. Uh, and if you were to um, invest in a program like that, it creates local jobs throughout the country in construction. Uh, it helps out local governments that can't raise that money in other ways because voters are voting down bonds you know, for schools all over the country. So um, the reason, though, uh, that it's good to have legislation is you, you spell out the specifics of that idea, as President Obama did. He said, I will put $30 billion towards this goal, and he specified the benefits for society. He similarly proposed uh, large investments in infrastructure and clean energy. The Republican-controlled uh, Congress in this session voted down every single element of his bill in a series of seven to eight votes, uh, basically along party lines. The only part of it they accepted was a payroll tax cut. So his plan would have created about two million jobs, and we're walking away with, you know, with maybe you know a couple hundred thousand, but certainly nothing like what we need to close a jobs gap of ten million. Uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry to interrupt you. Didn't they also approve the jobs for veterans? 
Uh, you, you actually, you are correct. Yeah, that's you are correct. That, but yeah. person even vote against that. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. So, right, so he, right, that, that is a good example, too, because he has to frame his ideas in a very clever way to appeal to people who otherwise are disinclined to vote with him. Um, so, uh, but I think it is important for um, members of Congress to talk about job creation in a compelling way to educate the public. And so this is one of the reasons you need legislation. Even at a time it's not likely to pass, uh, having a jobs bill gives you something to inspire the public imagination. If we don't have a transformative vision for creating jobs in America, we should you know, just quit and go home. Right? It's time to either go big or go home. So uh, we have, and one of the lists I distributed, a list of uh, bills that have been proposed uh, to create jobs here in America. And the first bill that's listed there is H.R. 870, which is proposed by Representative John Conyers from Michigan. And this bill is notable because it creates a large tax on financial, well, it's a small tax, but it raises a significant amount of money from a tax on financial transactions on Wall Street, a uh, tiny percentage tax on every stock, bond, and derivatives transaction that would go into a trust fund to create jobs, 150 to 200 billion uh, in the first couple of years, and that would be enough to create three or four million jobs here in America uh, that could be um, directed by state and local government, as was done with the Works Progress Administration, uh, and those would be in upgrading housing, uh, in, in youth programs, uh, quite, quite a range of things that could be proposed by local governments, uh, actually attaching, offering these workers to local nonprofit organizations that meet community needs uh, for various kinds of social services. Uh, so that program is significant because uh, it has a bold vision and it also is linked uh, programmatically to the Humphrey Hawkins legislation even though it, it may not have as aggressive a goal as we would like to see and we've been pushing to have it amended uh, it's, it's picking up on language that says we should offer a job to every American and we're going to start this program uh, to develop a trust fund uh, to enact that. And so that's really the only bill I would say that really speaks about full employment in any capacity by trying to off, uh, link it to Hawkins and then the Humphrey legacy. Uh, we also have a bill from Representative Jan Schakowsky from Chicago that would create about two million direct public service jobs including things like a neighborhood core and a child care core uh, that would be available to people throughout the country uh, who are in need of public service employment. She funds her bill through a temporary surcharge on millionaires and billionaires and also closing tax loopholes uh, for oil and gas companies. Um, a third uh, bill that has um, quite a bit of support is the uh, bill to create a national infrastructure bank introduced by Representative Rosa DeLauro from Connecticut and Senator John Kerry. And uh, that bill has over 77 co-sponsors in the House. This is less of a direct job creation program, but it would be a new bank similar to uh, the European Investment Bank, uh, and it would uh, fund infrastructure pro projects throughout the country based on their merits. Uh, and so it would take some of the political aspects out of infrastructure funding. It would have a separate board uh, to choose projects based on uh, th their, um, their benefits and, um, and their ability to uh, restore the funding. Uh, or pay back the funding over time. Um, another bill that's worth mentioning is uh, Representative Marcy Kaptur from Ohio has proposed legislation to uh, recreate the Civilian Conservation Corps, which we had in the 1930s, which was involved in uh, renovating, um, renovating parks and planting trees and restoring uh, in the environment throughout the country. And uh, her bill has about 22 co-sponsors right now. And one of the benefits of that kind of a bill is we think it would be uh, quite popular that many uh, young people, uh, given the chance to have a, a public service job, working in nature, building trails, um, you know, working in parks, uh, you know, maybe at some distance from their home, but it also could be relevant for upgrading parks in urban and suburban areas too. So it could be quickly implemented uh, and we think um, would have um, a lot of benefits. Um, so, uh, I was going to say, in order to get to where we need to get with job creation in this country, we're going to, it's only going to happen if we build a very powerful social movement that starts to put some political power behind these issues. We, we have these bills, but we have a Congress that is really not inclined to vote for them, and even when we've had some uh, a majority of Democrats, they're not wildly enthusiastic about lots of government intervention in the economy, or that's how they characterize this. Um, I believe, you know, uh, that uh, public job creation has been unfairly demonized uh, by conservatives in this country. 
that we, um, they say only private companies can be job creators. And what I would say is we have public jobs now, we have nonprofit jobs, and we have private sector jobs, and every sector has something to contribute to economic regeneration and job recovery. So that if we can give people opportunities to work at nonprofit organizations in this country, we have so many people unemployed and so many services that are not available, we should absolutely do that. And similarly, uh, public investment can help generate new industries, as it did when, for example, uh, the Pentagon developed the uh, Internet as a way of riding out a nuclear attack by having this decentralized system of electronic communication. Um, eventually that system had great benefits uh, for the economy and even today now we see things like Google and Facebook and private investors making lots and lots of money after, off of something that was developed with public investments. So uh, in a similar way, if government invests in clean energy um, as the Apollo Alliance, a, a coalition of labor and environmental groups has recommended, if you have a 10-year program, 500 billion program, invest $50 billion a year in uh, clean energy, energy conservation, and hybrid vehicles. The program uh, will pay for itself over that period of time and give all kinds of spin-off inventions to Americans that we can create pri private companies around and have a new boom of, of, of economic health. So um, I think we need coalitions like the Apollo Alliance uh, to get to a new level on organizing for jobs. And so uh, Apollo Alliance recently merged with another group called the Blue Green Alliance, which is a, a coalition of four national environmental groups and over 10 labor unions, giving a chance for workers and environmental groups to work together. A uh, similar type of coalition is coming together called Caring Across Generations, which tries to bring uh, healthcare workers together with people who need caregiving in their community for, for, for kids and for adults. And that's another, I think we're going to need the very strong coalitions between labor and the community interests that would benefit from the services that could be provided by a public jobs program uh, to really move this issue. Because right now Congress is not listening uh, to individual demands that are made by people. Uh, we need a much more organized and uh, aroused public uh, to push for the types of programs um, if, if they're ever going to, to get anywhere. Uh, okay, so I'm out of time. and. Uh, I will uh, uh, retire and surrender the floor to Judy Goldberg. Thanks, Chuck. I hope I will pick up uh, I, uh, from where both of you have uh, left off. Um, it's clear that we've never had a really full-scale social movement for uh, full em um, employment. Uh, we had a lot of movements even during the, uh, during the Depression. We got some concessions, but the permanent concession was not to uh, maintaining some form of uh, government uh, job uh, uh, creation um, as a kind of um, a active labor market policy. After people have been unemployed for a while and they don't have jobs, then uh, they theoretically are, um, and it's desired that they would be able to work for the government in a WPA type job. So I'm going to really talk about strategic and political challenges to large scale job creation. Uh, what are they? The challenges? I hope I'll get through all of them. One is anti-government ideology is a big challenge. The perceived failure of the Obama stimulus is, is another. The exaggerated concern over federal deficits is another. <coughs> shortcomings of the New Deal programs that are the model for job creations, which I think we have to acknowledge as well as to recognize that they did employed a lot of people and did a lot of good. And the limited scope and or sponsorship of, le of, of legislative initiatives. And finally, some obstacles to organizing a movement on behalf of the unemployed, of unemployment and job creation. <clears throat> Mass cre uh, 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 unemployment threatens to become a permanent phenomenon in the U.S. The official unemployment rate hovered around the double-digit mark for nearly two years, and currently, even with some reduction uh, since a high point of 10.2 percent unemployment um, to 8.3 percent this <coughs> February, uh, we have more unemployed people now than when Obama took office. Um, and one of the obstacles to job creation is the way that we count unemployment. Um, as you know, it's just the tip of the iceberg. And um, <clears throat> that um, if you're unemployed, uh, if you're out of work, uh, making less than a dollar a week, Helen, you're going to correct me on this, um, uh, in paid employment, uh, you are, um, you are uh, unless you are, uh, unemployed for less than a uh, dollar a, a, a week. One hour. One hour, sorry. One hour a week, you're not counted. 
So that leaves all the people who are, uh, and looking actively for work. So it leaves out people who are part-time, who would like to work full-time, and it leaves out all kinds of people who just aren't looking. Some of them discouraged, but not looking, but would take a job if there were one. So usually this is at least twice the, um, the um, <clears throat> official unemployment. And that serves, I think, as a barrier to people's recognition of the problem. One of the things that people do when they want to uh, encourage people to work on a problem is to talk about its magnitude. But it's systematically underestimated. And so that's one barrier. Um, and uh, we try to uh, attack that barrier by every month on our website publishing the, the whole thing. Let's tell, tell the whole story, we say, about the uh, job uh, uh, problem or the unemployment problem. Um, <clears throat> And, and I think Helen touched on this, but in searching for ways to end the current uh, um, employment crisis, it's important to bear in mind that unemployment is a chronic problem, and that we would hope maybe to attract attention to this mass problem, but at the same time to make uh, changes, as the Depression New Deal did, although not in this area, uh, did make permanent changes, say, in social welfare. Uh, uh, the uh, old age insurance, unemployment insurance, and a permanent federal presence even in the public assistance pro programs. Um, but uh, I think we need to bear in mind that when in 2000, when the official unemployment was 4%, the lowest in 30 years, 13 million or 9% of the labor force were official um, or hidden unemployed. Um, in that year, nearly 16 million people also worked full time for less than the poverty level for the family of four. And I think we need to also keep in, char in, t in touch with the idea that official appointment, when it was at this 40-year low, 8.2% um, of African Americans were officially unemployed. And that's a number that is the same as the amount of overall unemployment in February 2009, when it was such an emergency that we had to have a stimulus. So it is a chronic crisis, particularly for some minorities. Now, I just want to say a word about the policy goal, because in order to talk about uh, challenges, you need to say what the policy goal is. And the assumption here is that the way to solve the jobs crisis is through massive federal action, specifically direct job creation by government. Uh, the stimulus, as we'll talk about, uh, 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 and we talked about quite a bit earlier at, at the earlier session, um, it was a fairly big one, although many thought not big enough, but the money was spent very inefficiently. And essentially, it, the $200,000 per job created or saved at best, when a direct job creation strategy could do it for 50000 and as Phil Harvey has pointed out in one of the papers that was read at this earlier session, it could have actually uh, 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 obliterated official unemployment. So um, it, we, we, this is the, it, uh, the goal in mind. And just to give you some uh, idea of um, what the meaning of uh, a um, well, work program is, and the idea of maybe short-term uh, cash benefits for the unemployed, and then when they can't find a job, they move into a work program. Um, and uh, here's Harry Hopkins the federal administrator and the head of the WPA, the Works Progress Administration, talking about what this means. He said, I would like to clarify here the difference between work relief and a job on a work program such as the Civil Works Administration and WPA. Um, by um, a work relief, it's really what we meant, uh, what, what do we call it um, um, recently? Workfare. 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 You work for the Welfare Department, uh, actually. Uh, to the man on relief, the difference is very real. On work relief, although he gets the disciplinary uh, rewards of keeping fit and of what, making a return for what he gets, his need is still determined by a social worker, and he feels himself to be something of a public ward with small freedom of choice. When he gets a job on a work program, it's very different. He is paid wages, and the social worker drops out of the picture. His wages may not cover much more ground than his former relief budget, Usually it was a bit more. It was called a security wage. Um, but they are his to spend as he likes, choice. I am told that all over the country the response was the same when people went off work relief 
And we had, there was plenty of work relief initially when the federal government started providing relief in 1933 directly, um, cash, sometimes grocery orders, and sometimes people were put to work. But he said when, when this, when works, the Works Progress Administration was initiated, he said that there was a very different feeling. The wife of the WPA worker tossed her head and said, we aren't on relief anymore. My husband is working for the government. Um, okay, so that's what is in uh, the policy goal, and I think you always have to keep a policy goal in mind when you're uh, talking about strategies. At the same time, I think it's very important that even though this is a New Deal model, uh, that we acknowledge some of the um, deficits in that model. And uh, it never solved, never em employed all of the unemployed. Uh, it was between, I think, a fourth and a third at most, maybe half once, uh, of all of the unemployed. Um, it, the wages were very low. Um, blacks were employed, but not in proportion to their need. But they were dispro disproportionate. In other words, a fifth of the WPA roles on average was uh, African Americans. And women were under uh, under uh, served as well. They were about a, a fourth of the workforce, but they were six of the WPA. So, and, and I think we do have to, and the fact that it was not permanent. Uh, Roosevelt and Hopkins wanted it to be, but they pulled back uh, out of fear that they couldn't pass, uh, it, make it part of the Social Security Act. When did they pull back? What? When did they pull well, back? Well, they pulled back. No, what they did is to form the WPA. But the WPA was always a temporary program. At the same time of the passage of the Social Security Act, which was August of 35, a little earlier that year they passed the WPA, and supposedly 3.5 million people were to be employed. But it was always a temporary program. It always had to be reauthorized. And it was discontinued in 1940. So that was the history of it. And we were left, really, with this, this uh, situation that, um, you know, millions of people are unemployed and, and do not have the opportunity to be, uh, to have uh, a, 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 a job with the government. And, and you know, as again, you know all the wonderful things that was done by the WPA, so we lost the, uh, their services as well. We lost the, the product that they could have produced all of these years. Uh, okay, so that was one of the, uh, we need to acknowledge uh, the, the weaknesses. Um, the anti-government ideology that still reigns. Um, and we've had decades of it, and of course the f famous Reagan statement, you know, government isn't the solution, government is the problem. Um, if public investment, and, and you know, it's a kind of a, a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you say that government can't do it, you essentially create a government that doesn't, and I guess Katrina is a great example. Uh, public investment, uh, relative to the size of the economy, has fallen to only half of its 1960s and 70s uh, levels. But despite those, this, the government is really doing a lot more than it's given credit for, and particularly in relation to this uh, 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 great recession. I mean, uh, when uh, the Depression, when Roosevelt came to power in 33, there was no welfare state. Now we have a semi-welfare state, and food stamps expanded tremendously. 43 million people are on food stamps. Many more people are making use of them. Unemployment insurance uh, went five times its size. I'm not saying these were great, the, the, the allowances are low, et cetera, et cetera, but um, a lot of people are being uh, help. Now, uh, the rest of the uh, welfare program, like TANF, is certainly not expanding. Even the head of the, Fed, of the uh, Senate Finance Committee, Mr. Bacchus, said it doesn't work when there aren't jobs. Well, to tell you the truth, it didn't work so well when there were jobs, but I won't go, go into that. But, um, but there's a, another, a sort of a downside to this, because I think, and I'm not alone, that, um, you know, if Shaw or Marx were looking at this, they'd say that these programs took the insurrectionary edge off of poverty and, in a sense, stilled protest. Because so many people were, and, and it was just the opposite in the period going 30 to 33. Lots of mass protest. Um, um, lots of unemployed councils and so on. So that, on, uh, on the one hand, uh, the, we could make use of this by saying the government does help people a lot. I mean, if I were Obama, but I don't know what Obama wants for sure, and somebody called me the food stamps president, I'd say, oh really? Do you mean I'm keeping 43 million people from hunger? Well, 
that's not so bad. I'd rather be the jobs creation president, but you guys in, in Congress won't, you know, won't vote with me. <laughs> but the thing is, I think that you can talk about the, in relation to the anti-government ideology, and of course it saved Wall Street, and they continue to, to bite the ham that, that, uh, that fed them. Uh, so uh, the anti-government ideology could be addressed. But I think we do have to make it, be aware of the fact that the welfare programs probably have uh, still protest until the Wisconsin group decided to handle their, to, to protest the uh, re revocation of their um, uh, right to organize, their, um, their labor rights, and until uh, Occupy Wall Street burst onto the scene. Uh, and, and, you know, that, you know, the programs really weren't so good. Half of the people don't get unemployment insurance. You know, you can, the other side of the coin. Um, uh, people, uh, uh, one of the placards said, uh, I didn't go to college to um, stay on food stamps. So that um, I think there was some recognition that uh, the programs aren't enough, and perhaps that's, uh, that may be the kernel of more um, uh, protest. Okay, um, I think the, uh, one of the other things, the, the idea that the Obama stimulus didn't work. Uh, we spent $787 billion and, and uh, look, uh, we still have fairly high unemployment. Now, actually, the estimates of uh, Federal Reserve people and uh, Moody people are that we would have had 16% unemployment if it hadn't been for the stimulus and the, um, uh, and, and the bailout and, and, and the government programs. But you can't very well run on that. Am I running out of time? Oh, good. Uh, I will. Um, at any rate, uh, so I think this Obama stimulus has, you know, as I said, was very inefficient. And I think we could talk about that and say that the money had, could be much better spent. Probably we needed more. But certainly the perception of its failure uh, and the difficulty of saying, oh, gosh, we didn't have a recession, you know. Um, I, 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 we didn't have a, a depression, sorry. So I think that that's another thing that has to be uh, countered. Now, the deficit is another one. Uh, the deficit, uh, shall I call it, hysteria. And I think that that, of course, has been one that um, Obama helped to create by elevating this deficit commission, appointing to it this Jake Simpson and people who are actually against the welfare state. What did Simpson say about... Uh, uh, 320 million, uh, Social Security was a, a milk cow with 310 million teats. This was uh, the guy who was appointed. To, so the, how do you handle the deficit? Well, you can diss the deficit. Uh, a, a very um, uh, uh, James Galbraith, a very um, distinguished economist, says, you know, it really isn't anything. The government can, pr can uh, print checks and uh, the government isn't going to, there's no one real analogy to a family budget. On the other hand, I think you can talk about what the uh, tax cuts, the Bush tax cuts at 1.3 trillion. You can talk about the military budget. You can talk about a stock transfer. Probably a combination of those. But certainly, this is a formidable barrier to government uh, job creation or any government uh, uh, program. Um, also, one of the main things is that unemployment is a huge creator of the deficit, for, responsible for 60% of the deficit in a, a recent uh, year. Okay. Now, the role of legislation, Chuck has talked about, and I think there's sort of two criteria for um, legislation. Uh, whether a bill gives a sense of reality to a policy goal. Um, in other words, if it's very, very small, it's hard to take it very seriously and to even maybe, again, you feed into this kind of disappointment. It really doesn't ha handle anything. On the other hand, something like the, um, the Conyers bill, uh, it, it has to be, it, and legislation, is, even if you don't get it, is very, very good for education. It gives a kind of reality to, to uh, the notion, oh, there's a bill, you know. But um, I, it really depends on the, also the stature and the numbers of sponsorship. And so far, we don't have that. But we maybe maybe we will be able to um, do that. Did we hear that Nadler uh, signed? Yeah, on? we have 50 co-sponsors for the Congress. Oh, that's building. good. So okay. it's gone up quite a okay. bit. Yeah. Now again, finally a movement. Um, well, movements, you know, come to um, can often be. Um, certainly, if you take the civil rights movement, it was new groups, not the groups that had been working all along, like the NAACP, but the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. 
um, and the um, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, new groups that arise in relation to a crisis um, and temporarily at least eclipse existing organizations that have been involved all along. And I think you can go over a whole lot of those organizations. I'm not going to really, I don't have time to do it now. Occupy Wall Street, of course, is a new organization. The 99ers was. Some organizations, like our organization, have been there a long time. We're hoping, to, we've tried to give support to a new organization like Occupy Wall Street. It's still up in the air the extent to which Occupy Wall Street will actually adopt a jobs goal. The New York group had a really very, very good one that we could, uh, but it didn't pass and I, I don't know, that we were very glad to see them with us uh, uh, before. So um, you, you can also talk about organizations that weren't for a long time thinking about full employment like Jobs with Justice or Demos that are becoming a little bit more involved in that. But um, uh, frankly, I think we probably need to, uh, where this, uh, mass movement is going to come from, uh, I, I really am not sure. Um, I really have dealt with some of the challenges that I think it will face and that we need to, uh, to uh, uh, deal with. Uh, just let me finish with one paragraph. Apparently arising spontaneously, a nascent social movement, Occupy Wall Street, caught the imagination of the public and did spread across the land. And really, we were out um, last year doing um, on, on the first Friday of the month when the um, Department of Labor announces its statistics and we were out vigiling in front of Schumer's office and, and you know every month in the cold <laughs> and nobody paid very much attention but somehow Occupy Wall Street a new organization um, and calling attention to a tremendous in inequality caught the imagination and so once again, a new organization could be eclipsing existing ones that had long been concerned, but without attracting uh, mass support. Um, it's taking aim at uh, economic inequality and speaking for the 99%. Will it focus on the cruel inequality of unemployment, chronic as well as crisis? Uh, it hasn't really solidified its de demands. And since so many issues are being raised and bringing out their advocates, it may be premature or counterproductive to do so as well as at odds with the uh, anarchist tendencies of some of the protesters. However, job creation along the lines of the New Deal is being considered. And uh, we advocates of large-scale job creation are joining the protests. And we have joined the protests. It's too early to know where this or some other spontaneous movement will become, whether it will become a new mass movement, and whether it will choose to press for uh, and perhaps achieve the dream of decent li uh, living wage jobs for all. Um, the labor movement I looked at, and I, you know, it's the organization you might look to. It has more resources despite its declining numbers. But if you look at its pages, um, the first thing it talks about is saving the middle class jobs of the public service workers, then extending unemployment of benefits, and way back there maybe some job creation. So it doesn't seem to be high on the list. Okay.